In the last chapter we saw that bandit boss brought some people with him from town. Some were his lackeys, some were sacrifices, but among them were two slaves. One was a woman who had wings instead of hands, and she was also their sex slave. One was a dog-eared girl who was no more than ten or eleven years old, bandit boss whose name we learn is Melon Puke, lol, was using the ten-year-old, dog-eared girl as his Dakimakura. A huge hug pillow which is used to hug while sleeping and has some anime girl picture on it is called Dakimakura. All the bandits were using the wing woman constantly. And some days after the bandit boss brought slaves and lackeys, knights were dispatched to kill the bandits. After killing the bandits they pile them up and burn their bodies so the dead bandits don't turn into ghouls. They start the fire inside the dungeon, which starts spreading inside the dungeon rapidly. The dog-eared girl was laying under the melon puke's bed, and the fire was coming towards her fast, so it was up to Kaima, our protagonist to save that dog-eared lowly or let her die if you guys enjoy our story, and find yourself coming back to our channel, and aren't subscribed, then please subscribe because, why not, you are coming back anyway. And thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the video. Hey, should we do anything about that dog-eared slave? By the time Rokoko remembered that, flames had already burned down the door to the boss's room and were fast approaching the bed under which the dog-eared girl was hidden. Her dead eyes reflected that she had completely given up. The deceased harpy slave had the same eyes before she died. Huh. I didn't do anything to protect her from the bandits, but I get the feeling she'll appear in my dreams if I don't save her here. Well, I guess it doesn't matter. She can just turn into DP for us. No, wait. We're gonna save her. Can we get her in here somehow? Um, no. Do you want to go outside and try to get her yourself? Everything's on fire out there. She'll be dead before you get there. Rokuko was right. Since there was an intruder on the floor, we could only enter and exit the master room through the dungeon core. And outside of the dungeon core was a sea of fire. Physically saving her would be beyond impossible. Plus, we can't withdraw intruders or anything like that. She's not an item. After hearing Rokuko say that, an idea struck me like lightning. No. What are you talking about, Rokuko? She is an item. Eh? I started to talk as if trying to convince both myself and Rokuko of that. Slaves are tools. They belong to people. In other words, they're items. Honestly, I've never seen her do anything on her own. She only ever obeyed orders. And now her owner, the boss of the bandits, is dead. The owner of that slave. That item is gone. When the owner of an item dies in a dungeon, their items become the dungeon's items. Which means that girl is now an item belonging to us. Right, Rokuko? But she's a living being with mana. Items aren't like that. Remember how we withdrew that moldy bread earlier? Well, mold is a living being. We could withdraw a treasure chest even if a mouse was inside of it, right? There's no reason why we couldn't withdraw a living being like a human. We can't because she has mana? That doesn't make sense. Magical items have mana. We withdrew that light enchanted magic item, remember? Same deal. We can do this too. We can withdraw her. I glanced between the monitor and the map. The fire had reached the bed and started burning the sheets black. The map still displayed the dog-eared girl as a red dot, signifying her as an invader. Crap, that still wasn't enough. I didn't convince Rokuko hard enough. Be but I'm telling you, slaves aren't items. Then she's not even a slave. She's a Dakimakura. It's a Dakimakura. A pillow in the shape of a super young dog-eared girl. Just look, it can fit under the bed so we guys can hide it when the parents come home. The only option left for me was to use conditioning on myself. In other words, hypnosis. And hypnosis is basically the same thing as sleeping. This is my time to shine. That's a Dakimakura, that's a Dakimakura, that's a Dakimakura, that's a Dakimakura. I imagined it. That girl was a Dakimakura. A Dakimakura that'd feel amazing to squeeze in bed. It had ears to tease and play with. It was shaped like a human so one could dress it up with clothes and ease socks before playing with it. 
Wow. This is going pretty well. Yeah. I can't let a Dakimakura that amazing get burned up. It'd be a total waste. Ah. Uh, I want to sleep with that Dakimakura. I could spend hours putting different kinds of knee socks on it. It looks pretty nice and warm, too. I could use it as a makeshift heater when the weather gets colder. Speaking of heaters, the boss of the bandits used Rokuko's core as a heater for his feet. Oh, I'm getting off subject a little. You know, I wonder if that Dakimakura is more expensive than a heavenly pillow. A dark-skinned, dog-eared, little girl pillow must be expensive. That's a high-grade item. To some people, that would be the most heavenly pillow in the world. A thorough cleaning will make it clean as new. Yep, yep. Purification sure is useful. I wonder how well it'll clean a Dakimakura. Either way, at least I don't have to worry about taking the cover off and drying it outside where a neighbor might see it. By that point, the doggered girl had turned entirely into a Dakimakura in my mind. I glanced at the map and saw that instead of a red invader dot, there was a green dot indicating an item. All right, it's a Dakimakura. Withdraw. To sum it up, I did it. Yeah. H, how did you withdraw her? Invaders can't come into the master room. Huh. All I did was withdraw a Dakimakura. Oh yeah, and be sure to absorb the bandit corpses before they all burn up. But leave half of them behind, just in case the knights come in to check up on them. Ah, uh, its hair is a little burnt. What a waste of pretty black hair. Well, hair can grow back, so no big deal. I'll just cut off the burnt parts. A short haircut would look good on it. I rubbed the soot off its squishy cheeks. Oh man, this thing feels really nice. I tried casting purification on the Dakimakura. The purification magic formed a bubble-like shape like always and lowered itself through the Dakimakura from head to toe, thoroughly cleaning off all the filth at H. Ah? Uh? The Dakimakura let out a cute squeal. Why it reminded me. This is actually the doggered slave girl. Not a pillow. Phew. A bit longer like that and I might never have snapped out of my own hypnosis. Hey, all right. I'm back to my senses now. See? I told you we could withdraw her. Oh, you're back to normal? Then explain how you did that. Sure. It's pretty simple. I could do it because it was possible. You thinking you couldn't do it was just an assumption on your part. Magic is more free and less restrictive than you think. Though doing all that was pretty tiring. You saw it, right? I withdrew a slave. Cause their items. Wow. I had no idea you could withdraw slaves, but I guess you can. Yeah, it should be smart to make Rokuko think that. I don't want to have to hypnotize myself again the next time we need to withdraw a slave. But anyway, what should we do with this doggered girl? Should I actually start using her as a Dakimakura? By the way, what's this girl's name? It's kind of hard to talk about her without knowing her name. That's a good point. Air, do you have a name? Or at least, something that people call you? Ah. Uh, ah. Uh, people called. Me and the others, Nika. Master. All right. You're Niku, then. Her response was pretty slow, but she did answer me. Either way, the first thing to do was let her rest. I bought her a futon and some food with DP to start things off. She didn't move at first, but she ate the food and got into the futon after I ordered her to. I decided to think more about what to do with Nika after the knights left. As long as they were still around, we weren't safe. Day 20 the knights didn't really do much after that. They quietly made camp, checked that the corpses had all burned by noon, and then left. Yeah, I think it's pretty impressive that they managed to cook meat and eat it while corpses were burning like 30 feet away from them. Like honestly. Wow. We got a lot of DP thanks to all the dead bandits and how the band of thirty-some knights stayed within the dungeon radius for almost an entire day. We didn't even have any problems absorbing the thoroughly burnt corpses. Suffice to say, we made bank. Adding it all up to what we had before. Our DP stock had shot up to 14,504 in one fell swoop. Wow. I've never seen this much DP before in my life. 
compared to how little DP we were earning before, we had basically gotten rich overnight. But since the bandits were gone, our daily DP gain was less than before. We didn't have to worry about Gobsuk anymore. But in his place, we had the dog-eared slave. We had to feed her too. Three meals a day with food and drink. We'll be losing about 10 DP every day. But our natural DP gain was only 10 a day. Maybe due to how we had withdrawn her as an item, the slave girl wasn't earning us any DP. Though it was also possible that she just wasn't strong enough to be worth any DP in the first place. Thanks to that, our DP earnings a day totaled to a spectacular zero. Wait, no? We were technically in the negative since we would need to summon goblins whenever adventurers came just to avoid suspicion. Could I sleep well in a situation like that? No, I couldn't. I was a cautious, cautious man. I couldn't bear to sit and watch as my savings slowly dwindled. So, unable to bear the weight of losing DP, I decided to fundamentally change this ordinary cave. Ha! Huh. I don't want to work. Day 21 all right. Now that things have settled down and there aren't any bandits, let's think about what to do next. The main thing on my mind is that create golem spell I saw earlier. Magic that can make golems. Yep, that sounds perfect. Things will be easier for me if I can make golems do all the work for me. Yeah? But all that magic can do is make golems. You should just use that DP to summon golems as monsters instead. They cost 100 DP each, and they're strong enough. So basically, this spell will pay for itself after I use it to create 100 golems. Every golem after the 100th is basically free. Wow, what? That's amazing. But to be honest, there's way too many unknown factors to actually know that for sure. How strong will the golems I make be? Can I really summon them for free? Will I even be able to summon 100 of them? The spell may not end up paying for itself. It's impossible to tell right now. To tell the truth, I halfway want it just because I want to try making some golems. I mean, it sounds really fun, right? Let's not tell her about all this. Alrighty then. I'll have one create golem scroll, please. And... Sweet, there it is. I used 10,000 DP to buy a create golem scroll and soon enough a string-tied scroll made of animal skin appeared. I tried not to think about how we had just lost two-thirds of our DP in a single purchase. Let's try to use this thing. I undid the string and unrolled the scroll. It had create golem written along the top of it with a magic circle in the middle. How do you use scrolls like this? Just pour your mana into the magic circle. I followed Rokuko's advice and tried pouring my mana into the magic circle. It felt a lot like using the survival magic spell purification, somehow. All I had to do was put my hand on the magic circle and clench it into a fist before I started feeling mana flowing out of my body. It was just a little tiring. My mana flowed into the magic circle and started running along its lines. Huh. So this is what it's like to let mana flow into something. How long should I do this, anyway? I guess I should just keep pumping out mana until it works. My mana flowed progressively faster into the magic circle. Once it reached its limit or something, the magic circle suddenly stopped resisting the flow of my mana, causing it all to burst and rain back onto me. It felt as if the composition of the magic circle was being ingrained within me as my body was showered with mana. Actually, it probably was being ingrained within me. Once it finished, I bet I could use Create Golem. As for the scroll, the magic circle on it was scorched black, and after all my mana left it, the whole scroll caught fire and turned to ash. I decided to go ahead and try out Create Golem immediately. Two things were necessary to use it, mana, and material to make the golem's body with. Somehow, I just knew that. Knowing instinctively how to use a spell must be one side effect of using a scroll. It seemed that using the ground itself to make clay golems was the most simple thing to do. The golem could have its shape changed by mana. I stood up to leave the master room and go dig out some clay, but before I left, I noticed Meat sitting in the corner of the room with her arms around her legs. She had woken up at some point without me noticing. That was where Gobsuk always used to sit. Mmm. -hmm nostalgic. I don't have to go outside myself. 
If I have a tool available to me, I better use it. Hey, meet dot go outside and mine some clay for me. Not a lot, just about this much. Oh, okay. Understood, master. I ordered meat to go outside and bring back about a soccer ball's worth of clay. Man, she really does look dead inside. I've never seen an expression that blank in my life. After a while, meat came back with the shovel and clay. The way she was holding up the clump of clay with her tiny body made it look really heavy. Actually, I bet it actually was heavy for a child like her. It's kinda late to say this but Meat can go in and out of the master room on her own without any issues. Maybe because Rokuko thinks it's normal for that to be possible, or something? Sweet, good job. You can rest now. I patted her head and praised her. While I was at it, I cast purification on her since her hands had gotten dirty with clay. She let out a cute, Hi, af you, cry for some reason. Does it tickle when I cast purification or something? I should have Rokuko cast it on her later as an experiment. Depending on Nika's reaction, I might just learn something. All right, no point waiting around. Create golem! I sent my mana flowing into the clump of clay. The mana formed circuits within it and morphed the clay into the shape of a person. Perhaps thanks to the scroll, the image of a perfect golem arose in my mind. Well, it's actually a lot smaller than I expected, but that's fine. Probably. Everything will be okay. Obeying the instructions that were filling my mind, I kneaded the clay with my hands while pouring more mana into it. It didn't take long until the clay turned into a, somewhat small, human-shaped golem. I had based its design on the things I had played with at school before being summoned. In other words, it looked like a 30 centimeters tall robot. Instead of a servomotor moving its joints though, there was magic. Its body was made of clay instead of plastic and aluminum. Its movements were controlled by an embedded magic circle instead of a CPU. It had a magic stone powering it instead of a battery. Wait, we didn't have any magic stones. Oh well. We can just power it externally. The magic power floating around inside the dungeon's air should be good enough. After spending about ten more minutes sending mana into it, the 30 centimeters tall mini clay golem was complete. Wow. What's that? A golem. What's with all the question marks? Well, golems are usually way bigger than an adult human. I'm pretty sure we would need to make a lot more than a hundred of these for the scroll to pay for itself. I mean, I don't know what's normal or not, so... Either way, we'll just have to make ten thousand of them then. I decided to just order the golem around and see what happened. First, I made it start working on expanding the cave. That would help us save more DP. After bringing up the map and ordering the golem to go to the goblin room and start mining inwards through the mountain, the freshly made mini clay golem left the master room without even grabbing the shovel. Golems sure are dumb, aren't they? That shovel would make his job so much easier. Nope. You don't know what you're talking about, Rokuko. I'm basically stunned here, shocked by the vast potential golems have. Rokuko must have been thinking something like, Golems can't do anything complicated. But that was way too narrow of a mindset. If you think about it, dig into the mountain is a pretty complicated order on its own. To make a robot in modern Japan do something like that, you need to first teach it how to mine a wall in the first place from the ground up. Not only that, but telling them, go here. Wouldn't work. You'd have to tell them exactly how many steps to take, and even how to move their legs. They wouldn't stand up on their own if they fell over, and if they hit a wall on the way there, they'd keep walking into the wall forever. But with magic, all I had to do was say, go here and mine into the wall. Golems were amazing. I'm seriously moved right now. But using magic was pretty tiring. I think I'll just go to sleep now. Oh, right. I'll try using meat as a Dakimakura. That's why I saved her, anyway. Kind of. Come here, little girl. Air. Don't worry, I won't do anything perverted to you. Yep. I won't make you wear any socks or anything yet. That can come after we know each other better. Day 21 Let's just make one thing clear. Humans. Are not. Good. Dakimakuras. 
I tried using meat as one, but... Oh, don't worry. I didn't take her clothes off or anything. I seriously just used her as a dakimakura. Anyway, it was nice at first. Her skin was nice and smooth, plus her hair smelled nice. But it didn't take long for a problem to arise. Her body heated up fast. She got so, so hot. Yeah, I'm not gonna be able to handle this outside of winter. I finally understand why people huddle together to stay warm in survival movies and stuff. Though I have heard that kids have especially high body temperatures. And I've also heard that dogs are hotter than humans. In which case, it makes complete sense that a doggered little girl would be extremely hot. Plus, it wasn't until I noticed how heavily she was breathing that I realized she was running out of air beneath the covers. That was pretty dumb of me. Obviously, she would struggle to breathe without access to fresh air. I hurriedly pulled her head out of the covers which ended up with us lying in bed together, face to face. Her cheeks had flushed from the heat and her mouth was hanging weakly open, which made her lips look really sexy f. Wait, no. I'm not a lilicon. Seriously, I'm not a lilicon. Her breath was tickling me, so I made her turn and face the other way. I didn't do that because she was making my heart beat too fast to sleep. Her breath was ticklish. That was all. With that I was finally comfortable enough to sleep. But then another problem arose. A pretty big problem, too. You see, Meat couldn't move while I was using her as a Dakamakura. She'd have to push me off her if she wanted to get up, but as a slave, she couldn't do that. Can you imagine what happened because of that? She. Peed. Herself. Okay, okay. I knew it was my fault. I felt something wet when I woke up and then panicked like crazy after seeing Meat crying in my arms. I stood us up and cast purification on me, her, and the futon while patting her head and telling her that everything would be okay. Yeah, it was my fault. I'm sorry. Next time you need to go to the bathroom, just push me aside and go. To show how sorry I am, you can eat as much food as you want today. Ask for anything, it's yours. Okay? Here, have a hamburger. They taste super good. So stop crying. I'm sorry, it was my fault. Meat finally calmed down after she finished eating the hamburger. Um, okay. I would like to begin our first meeting on what to do with Kaima, the pervert who loves to make his slave girl pee on him. Hey, hold up. That's a pretty biased way of framing things, Madam Judge. It was an accident, Your Honor, I swear. I used my position as dungeon master to make Rokuko shut up about how I had accidentally made Meat pee herself. She immediately fell silent, so I decided to start making more golems. The mini clay golem I made yesterday had been working all night. Yeah, I should check out how he's doing first. Let's see here. I brought up the dungeon monitor from the menu and checked up on the golem I had ordered to dig into the mountain. The mini clay golem was steadily scratching away at the wall. His spirit was admirable, but he hadn't made any progress at all. The bare rock wall was just too strong for his clay hands to wear down. That was my mistake. I should have given him a pickaxe or something. Mmm, -hmm, see? He'll just keep on doing what you told him to, no matter what. How long can he stay active? I think it has something to do with the magic stone inside of it. Eh? Well, obviously, he'll stay active until he runs out of mana. I mean, he's a golem. But dungeons are filled with mana, so he basically should never stop as long as he's inside of one. Wow, that's crazy. He basically doesn't need any energy to keep moving. I was losing my mind over how far golems had surpassed my expectations. It was looking like I would be able to just leave everything to the golems and sleep as much as I wanted. Is Kaima's dream of not having to work coming closer? Tell us in the comments, and if you guys enjoyed this part please subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to like the video, and we will see you in the next chapter. Bye.